Rina Conti, I am um, an associate professor of um, health economics at Boston University's Question School of Business. I also direct the Center on um, Pharmaceutical Outcomes and Economics at, um, at BU. I have no disclosures. I'm Timothy Wilt. I'm a general internist, health services researcher at the Minneapolis VA and a professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota. Disclosures. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. I have no disclosures. My name is Jill Johnson, and I'm a clinical pharmacist and professor at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences, and I have no disclosures. Greg Kerfman, deputy editor, JAMA. That's my only disclosure. <laughs> I'm Tim McBride. I'm a professor at Washington University in the Brown School, and I have no disclosures. Don Casey. I'm Chief of Clinical Affairs and Senior Vice President for MedDecision, which is a population health technology company. I have academic appointments at Rush Medical College, Jefferson College of Population Health, and um, recently appointed to the Institute of Healthcare Informatics at University of Minnesota. Hi, I'm Albert Huang. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. I have no disclosures. Oh, no, no conflicts. Stuart Winston, I'm a cardiologist in a large multi-specialty group in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and a patient experience uh, coach and uh, instructor. I have no disclosures. Scott Misek, professor of pharmacy practice at the St. Louis College of Pharmacy, and I have no disclosures. Rachel Sachs, associate professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis, and no disclosures. I'm Aaron Carroll. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Indiana University School of Medicine, and I also have no disclosures. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to turn over uh, the morning session to uh, Steve Pearson, um, who is the president and CEO of uh, ISO. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, we're, it sounds like you can hear me pretty well through the microphones. I think some of the others aren't projecting as well. Am I right? OK, so we're going to just redouble our efforts to have the CPAC members pull it uh, embarrassingly close to your face when you, uh, when you have something to say. Rock stars. But style. thank you for being with us today. Um, I just have a brief introduction to today's um, uh, meeting. And it starts with a discussion of why we're here. And <clears throat> we do like to start from the patient's perspective. And so here are a couple of quotes. Uh, actually, I think it's just one this time from, a, from a, an asthma activist. I often say my severe asthma is like a firecracker. When the fuse is lit, will it explode or will it fizzle out? You can never predict how an asthma exacerbation will end. Learning to control my symptoms and living with the risk of experiencing a debilitating flare-up are intricate parts of my journey with severe asthma. Now, asthma is one of those very common conditions. I'm just wondering how many of you have asthma or have a family member or a close friend who has asthma? Yeah, it's almost everybody. I mean, for me, it was most directly my wife, who was hospitalized several times with severe asthma when she was younger and we were first uh, getting to know each other. And um, at one point, she was almost in the ICU. I know, and many of us know, both how acutely severe asthma can be and the effects of chronic steroid use, the effects of chronically being worried when a next exacerbation will happen, will be, you'll be able to manage it, and how it affects not just your health, but your entire life. So this is a common condition that has very important and deep impacts on patients and their families. Now we're here today because we have new treatment options, and that's fantastic for many reasons. And new treatment options do often raise questions, though, about appropriate use, about the cost, because they're new, and we're learning how to use them. Now, we also believe we're here today because we fundamentally believe that patients get better access to innovation and to, this afford and to more affordable care when the prices for innovation are aligned with the clinical benefits that they receive. And that is linked to an insurer's community that reciprocates with fewer coverage restrictions. That for patients, that's the win-win. They get innovative new treatments at a price they can afford, 
and at an access strategy that allows them to get it when they need it. So to support that kind of approach, we believe we're here today because it's helpful to have an objective evaluation of the evidence on both comparative clinical effectiveness and on value. So you've been introduced to the members of the Midwest Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Council, an independent group that comes to help deliberate on this information in a public setting. And ICER is, in a sense, the academic uh, secretariat for this process. So I need to tell you a little bit about ICER and the structure of the report that serves as the foundation for today's meeting. So first, ICER is an independent not-for-profit. We keep an updated pie chart of our funding um, on our website. And you can see the, the big red, uh, reddish section comes from nonprofit foundations, chief among which are the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, um, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the Kaiser East Bay Community Health Foundation. We do have a small government contract, and we have something separate which we call our Policy Summit Program, where we do take money from manufacturers and from the payer community in roughly equal proportions to support a, a kind of an evidence policy program for their leadership, um, where we try to convene and get them to think proactively and prospectively on how to use evidence better in the healthcare system. But that money is not used to support the report uh, reviews, um, analyses, et cetera, that we do today. So how was the ICER report um, today developed? It started over seven months ago uh, with a process of what we call scoping. And scoping means going out to patient groups, to the manufacturers, to clinical experts, and saying, look, we don't even know what we don't know. Some of us may be doctors, some of us may be methods experts, some of us may even have the condition. But we need to learn from you what's important to patients, what we should think about when we're thinking about the evidence on both effectiveness and value. So we reach out to all those groups and start a longitudinal process with them um, that is very intensive. We do an internal ICER staff evidence review of the published literature and other information that we seek patient reported outcomes, real world evidence, we're <laughs> eager and hungry to get the best information we can to help guide these deliberations. We work with outside academic cost effectiveness modelers frequently, and today's model was developed by researchers at the University of Col Colorado. We go through several different phases of public comment and revision to the report, and we also have clinical expert and patient expert reviewers including, in this case, David Stukas, Kenny Mendez, who is here with us, and Matt Stevenson. So briefly, going through this process, how is the evidence and the information channeled and, and kind of categorized um, in, in our report, and to a certain extent to support the structure of today's um, discussion? First, our value framework, which is the model we use for our report, starts with the goal that we really do believe that all stakeholders share in the healthcare system, and that's to figure out how to achieve sustainable access to high value care for all patients. Now, we believe that there are two major components of information that can help us get there. If decision makers think about the long-term value for money, and they think about short-term affordability. Now, the anchor for our cost effectiveness and our value-based pricing is the long-term value for money, but that itself has four different components. It starts with a straight-up look at the evidence on comparative clinical effectiveness. Then there is an incremental cost effectiveness model, which looks at the long-term effects on patients. We also will have discussion around other benefits or disadvantages. Those are things that might not be captured in the clinical studies or in the cost effectiveness model, but which are in some cases very, very important to patients, their families, and others in thinking about the value of different treatment options. And similarly, contextual considerations often help us all frame where we are in the treatment course with different conditions, whether there are special elements of severity um, or other aspects of social values that we wish to bring to decision making. And our report for short-term affordability provides a rough estimate of potential budget impact at the national level in which stakeholders can do their own guesswork and try to figure out if the uptake of a new treatment is X, what would the potential budget impact be, and decide whether 
that has an important influence on their decision making about bringing the innovation into the system. So today with us this morning, I just wanted to briefly introduce um, at this table, we have two clinical experts and a representative from the patient community. So first, I'm glad to welcome Dr. Mario Castro. As you can see here, he's a professor of medicine, pediatrics, and radiology um, here at the Wash U School of Medicine. And the, the disclosures are up there, but actually, why don't I let you folks introduce yourselves? Um, you don't have to mention your disclosures because they are up there, unless there's any change to them since we last talked to you. So, Dr. Castro, I've already kind of told folks who you are, but please feel free to, to, to say hi to, to the. Thanks, to the group. Steve. Um, are you, actually, it's turned on. You just, you just have to lean close to it. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Good morning, and uh, thank you all for coming to St. Louis and our nice, uh, chilly weather here. Uh, I'm a pulmonologist, I'm an asthma expert, uh, deal with severe asthma every day in our severe asthma clinic, um, and so I'm at Washington University in, here in St. Louis, so uh, thank you for uh, again for being here. Thank you. And Dr. Semino, please introduce yourself. Good morning. Can you hear me okay to hear? Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Kaharu Sumino. I am a staff physician at uh, VA Medical Center here, as well as Associate Professor of Medicine at WashU uh, Medical School. I also um, specialize in asthma uh, clinically, as well as research, uh, too. So um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And Kenny? Great. Thank you. I'm I'm Kenny Mendez. The disclosures are up there. I'm president and CEO of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Thank you for having us. I'm relatively new to AFI. I just started there in January, but after being through this process, I feel like I'm, I'm not new anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We've worn you down already. So. By the way, if you haven't noticed already, those of you who always wanted to lip sync or do a Rolling Stones bit, you can take that microphone stand and tilt it just in the right way. It looks very uh, rock and roll. <laughs> So the agenda today um, uh, will launch after this into a presentation of the evidence on effectiveness and economics. Um, and we will introduce those presenters at that time. Then there will be a manufacturer public comment and discussion uh, phase in which they will come up to the table and we'll have back and forth um, with around those comments. Then general public comments and discussion followed by um, lunch. And then we'll come back and reconvene right at 1 o'clock to start the further discussion that leads up to several votes on effectiveness um, and the other benefits, et cetera. Following a short break, we'll then reconvene again for about an hour and yeah, about an hour 15 minutes for a policy roundtable discussion. And I'll just say briefly now, that's where we look forward and we talk about how we take the information, the evidence, the testimony, the bigger picture, how do we translate that going forward into better research, into better clinical care for patients, and how do we translate it into coverage and pricing that will, again, facilitate that overall goal of making sure that we achieve sustainable access to high-value care. And we fully intend to be done by 4 o'clock after a final wrap-up of final reflections. All right, with that, let me introduce Dr. Jeff Tice, professor of medicine at UCSF, who will um, who was the evidence author and will lead us through a summary of the evidence on clinical effectiveness. Dr. Tice. Great. Thanks, Steve. And um, uh, it's great. Uh, it's a, a privilege to be here in St. Louis, my, my first trip here. Um, I had a, a number of colleagues uh, helping me at, at UCSF. I wanted to acknowledge Judith Walsh, another uh, professor of medicine and uh, evidence-based medicine expert who um, helped with the development of the report. And then within ICER, uh, Patricia Patty Sinnott was the uh, uh, um, senior research lead who, who helped with this work. And uh, none of us have any uh, disclosures uh, relevant to this uh, report. So we're all aware uh, here to, uh, that, that um, you know, severe asthma is a, a big problem. It uh, represents a, only a small uh, portion of patients with asthma, about 5 to 10%, but represents at least 50% of asthma costs. 
Um, the standard of care, uh, at least uh, at the time of many of the studies that we're going to talk about today, is uh, high-dose inhaled corticosteroids plus at least one other agent, typically uh, long-acting uh, beta agonist, though um, I, I think it'll be interesting to hear from the experts. My sense from talking to the experts is usually uh, pay, uh, the, the clinicians uh, have patients on a third agent, at least a uh, uh, long-acting uh, muscarinic agent, uh, leukotriene antagonists, uh, and, and other agents as well before moving on to biologics. But uh, biologic therapies are, are add-on therapies to these uh, standard therapies. And the ones we're going to talk about today, um, five, all target different aspects of uh, type 2 inflammation, which represents about half of patients uh, with the severe asthma phenotype. So uh, here's the list of the um, five agents um, and their mechanisms of action. They target uh, slightly different aspects. Uh, omalizumab, which has been uh, in clinical uh, 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 practice for about 11 years, it was approved in 2007, um, targets uh, IgE. It's a monoclonal antibody to IgE and, and primarily focuses on uh, patients with an allergic phenotype. Um, mepolizumab is the first of the uh, anti-IL-5 agents. It was approved in 2015, and um, uh, ICER considered it uh, soon after its approval. Um, again, a monoclonal antibody to IL-5. There's a second um, anti-IL-5 uh, agent, reslizumab, which was approved in 2016. Um, and then a third agent that's often lumped with the, uh, the two prior agents that targets the receptor uh, for IL-5. Um, uh, um, that's benralizumab, uh, approved last year. And then dupilumab, which in many ways was the incentive for the timing of the meeting today, uh, was approved just last month um, and targets a different receptor, the IL-4 receptor alpha, which actually is the uh, receptor both for IL-4 and for IL-13, so uh, down-regulates actions of, of those two interleukins. Um, this slide for the panel members is a slide that was added. I, I thought it was important to highlight um, some differences uh, both the, uh, in routes of administration and frequency of administration of these uh, agents, um, in, in mainly because these are important for, really important for patients. So one of uh, the five uh, Resolizumab is delivered IV, and I should say it's also uh, the only one that's weight-based, um, and some experts highlight uh, for some patients uh, this may be an advantage, particularly for heavier patients. Um, the frequency varies from every two weeks to every eight weeks, and this is mostly important because four of the five drugs, the first four, all um, have to be delivered in the presence of a healthcare provider. It's uh, labeled on the FDA label, so patients have to come into a doctor's office, essentially. And so it's a burden to come in every two weeks to a doctor's office to get this therapy. And one of the advantages of dupilumab um, from a patient perspective, I think, um, is that it can be uh, self-administered at home. So I just wanted to highlight those differences uh, among the five agents, I think, that are important for our patients in, in particular, um, and sometimes will drive what would be the ideal therapy from a patient's perspective. All right, um, back uh, um, to the evidence review itself. We uh, did a typical systematic review uh, following standard uh, guidelines. The target population reflected the FDA indications for the five agents. They vary, um, so they were fairly broad. So we looked for studies uh, in adults and children six years and older. Um, not all of the agents are approved for um, uh, children as young as six, um, but we wanted to look for all data there. Um, and we focused on patients with moderate to severe uncontrolled asthma and evidence of either eosinophilic inflammation, um, which is the FDA labeled indication for the last four drugs, or allergic asthma, um, the indication for omalizumab. Uh, we talked about the, the five interventions already, and the comparator is primarily standard of care. Um, that was true for all of the trials. Ideally, um, because these all target different aspects of type 2 uh, inflammation, we would like to see head-to-head -head comparisons um, for our comparators, but no studies were available directly comparing any of the agents. A key theme that we heard from patients, from clinical providers, um, and, and from the manufacturers is heterogeneity. So some of the trials enrolled patients six years and older, some 12 years and older, some 18 and older. Um, some limited uh, the patients to those with, with severe asthma, some allowed moderate to severe. The number of exacerbations in the prior year differed from study to study in the entry criteria. Some required at least one, some required at least two exacerbation in the prior year. 
Some of uh, the studies excluded patients on oral corticosteroids. Some just looked at patients who were using oral corticosteroids, and others allowed both. Typically, there were 10 to 20% in, the, um, the, uh, in the studies that had allowed oral corticosteroids but did not require it. About 10 to 20% of patients in those studies were typically using oral corticosteroids. The definition of exacerbations has evolved over time and was different uh, in some of the trials. And the length of follow-up for some of the important clinical outcomes, including quality of life, uh, varied when they were measured and, and the length of follow-up for the study. So it makes it really challenging to try and compare across studies. Um, so one, one of the big issues uh, everyone is wrestling with in this uh, area. Um, the results primarily come from prior meta-analyses. We didn't identify a lot of new studies, um, so we relied on the uh, results from the Cochrane meta-analyses of, of these agents. Um, these results here on the first slide, uh, this uh, first result slide, focus on asthma exacerbations and uh, a measure of uh, lung function improvements in FEV1, the amount of uh, uh, air expelled in a second. Um, and you see for the reduction in uh, asthma exacerbation rates compared to placebo, all of them uh, ranges from about 40 to 60 percent reduction. They're all about the same magnitude. An important difference, of course, the patient population studied in each of these studies is different. So benralizumab may have had a different relative uh, rate ratio if it was studied in the same uh, patients that omalizumab was studied in. So you shouldn't compare them directly, but it is interesting, and many people do highlight the fact that all of the therapies had a, a fairly similar reduction of cutting the exacerbation rates about in half compared to the placebo group. Um, and the FEV1 differences uh, were, were generally on the order of about 0.1 liter or a little bit more, with omalizumab being a little bit lower um, than the others in terms of the improvements in FEV1. Uh, for symptoms and quality of life, which really the most important outcome uh, I, th I think from a patient perspective and also when we come to the modeling, there are a number of different measures. Um, the asthma control questionnaire, the St. George's respiratory questionnaire, and the asthma uh, quality of life questionnaire that we used uh, in the studies. All of these were evaluated by uh, the NIH in a consensus uh, conference around measuring quality of life, and they were all found to be inadequate. Um, so that's a, a major issue in this area. But again, you see um, similar, uh, a similar pattern for the ACQ, where a, a clinically important difference would be about a 0.5 improvement. None of them achieved that uh, uh, level of improvement um, on, 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 on average. Of course, some patients did imp uh, improve uh, for a clinically significant amount. Others uh, had almost no benefit. Um, but th these are the average differences. Um, and they're, they're all statistically significant, but, but relatively modest. One um, uh, uh, group, uh, the, those who studied mepolizumab, uh, used uh, the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. Here there was an average uh, improvement of 7.4 points. Five, excuse me, four points I think is the uh, clinically uh, meaningful uh, difference. Um, so here we did see uh, that on the St. George's Questionnaire. On the Asthma Quality of Life uh, Questionnaire, an improvement of 0.5 is clinically significant. Um, uh, we see significant improvements for all of the agents that use that measure, um, but not, none of them on average were, uh, had, uh, reached that 0.5 threshold. Uh, a number of the therapies, all except for reslizumab, have been studied in, specifically in patients receiving oral corticosteroids. Um, the percent reduction in uh, uh, oral corticosteroid use ranged from about 50 to 75 percent for the active therapy group um, and uh, up to 25 percent reduction in the uh, placebo group. Um, if you look at the proportion who are able to completely come off oral corticosteroids, so this would be the greatest benefit because then you're no longer at risk for the long-term harms of, of uh, daily oral corticosteroid use. You see um, it ranged from 14% to 52% across the drug, so the largest benefits uh, were for benralizumab and for dupilumab. Um, but notice they also had a large placebo effect. So you, you, in the placebo group, up to 29% of the patients were actually able to come off of oral corticosteroids in the dupilumab study, 
even though they receive no active agent. And, and I think one of the things we consistently hear from um, the, uh, the clinicians who practice in severe asthma clinics is, boy, we need to make sure that they are really taking maximum doses of their uh, appropriate medicines, that they're adherent with the therapies, that they're actually using the inhalers the way they're supposed to. And I think in studies, attention is paid to that. And many of the patients improve without these uh, therapies. So that's one of the remarkable things when you look across these studies, just the, the degree of improvement in the placebo group groups. Um, we did try and level the playing field a little bit um, to compare across groups. So here, and, and, and uh, we thank the manufacturers, many of them actually supplied data that was not available in the clinical trial results. Uh, we tried to look at patients who had eosinophil counts of at least 300, patients who all had had at least two exacerbations in the prior year, so included those who had only one exacerbation in the prior year and who had an, a, a, a measure of asthma severity, the asthma control questionnaire, of at least 1.5, which was the entry criteria for a number of the uh, trials for many of the agents, but not for some. And so to, to, with, with that, we then did uh, a, an indirect meta-analysis where you sort of assume, you, you look at the improvements versus placebo um, for each of the groups and consider the placebo group a similar group across all of these uh, different agents and make indirect comparisons. And if you do that, you see for omalizumab in the subgroup, you improve from our uh, point estimate of about a 50% reduction down to almost a 70% reduction in uh, asthma exacerbations uh, compared to placebo. Um, and, and this was a typical theme. In general, this group was a higher risk subgroup, and not only did you get a big, bigger absolute benefit, but you tended to get a bigger relative benefit, primarily driven by the eosinophil count. So these are patients who have very active type 2 inflammation, and so these therapies are more effective. So you see that with mepolizumab, the point estimate is better. Resolizumab. For benralizumab, in this analysis, they already, in their trials, all of their patients had to have at least 400, uh, um, an eosinophil count of 400 or higher. Um, they had a greater than two exacerbations and an ACQ of greater than 1.5, greater than or equal to 1.5, so you don't see any change in the point estimate there. Uh, dupilumab, which uh, didn't have an eosinophil count uh, requirement for enrollment in the trials, but did report those, uh, uh, that, that subgroup, you see actually a 75% reduction in exacerbation rates versus a 50% in, uh, in, in the overall. So you see a big, big improvement there, which is probably why the FDA approved it specifically for eosinophilic asthma, not, not just for all uh, patients with moderate to severe asthma. So this is helpful. I, I, I want to say there's still uh, important heterogeneity in these uh, patient groups, so I would take this with a grain of salt, and I will say if you look in Appendix 5 of the full report, you see a plethora of uh, network meta-analyses coming to contradictory conclusions. Um, uh, so uh, we, we really need head-to-head -head trials to, to say with any confidence the rel relative benefits, but this, this gives you some sense. Um, and I, I should say here also, in this analysis, when we did head-to-head -head comparisons between each of the agents, none of the differences were statistically significant. So the, the full, what we call league table, with all of the pairwise comparisons uh, between all of these agents shows no statistical, uh, statistically significant difference uh, between any of the agents. Um, all right, adverse events. Really, there were no differences in significant uh, adverse events between active treatments and placebo. No differences in hypersensitivity reactions. The main difference was uh, in injection site reactions. And only uh, dupilumab had more, reported more withdrawals in the trial compared to placebo due to adverse events. And that was the dupilumab 300 milligram dose for the du uh, dupilumab. 200 milligram dose, there were actually fewer withdrawals due to adverse events, so this may be a chance finding even though it was statistically significant. Controversies and uncertainties, I, the heterogeneity of the population still is an issue. Um, I, I think uh, I, I uh, highlighted in the report the fact that uh, uh, Dr. Drazen, who's chief of pulmonary medicine at Harvard um, and the editor of the New England Journal was one of two people who wrote an editorial who said that the five therapies actually, they focused on the mo four most recent, the four therapies really should be viewed as essentially equivalently effective treatments until, and they, and they called for a head-to-head -head trials, um, pragmatic trials of these agents. Um, another important controversy is that the quality of life measures, which are essential to uh, evaluating the, um, uh, the outcomes, or were not consistently measured uh, uh, across trials. 
both in the instruments used and the timing, and, and then as I alluded to, um, uh, the, the quality of life measures that are available right now in asthma are not really ideal uh, for measuring quality of life and uh, an area where we need improvement. Um, there's little long-term and real-world evidence for the uh, more recently approved uh, drugs. Of course, uh, omelizumab has been around in clinical practice for 11 years, so we do have uh, good data there, and mepolizumab has been around for a reasonable uh, length of time. And of course, uh, the longer-term follow-ups from early trials have helped. Finally, there's no uh, clear definition of response to therapy to guide us about when to stop and when to continue these therapies, um, and, and that's a, an important uh, issue that, that needs to be better uh, defined. And hopefully we can do a little bit of that during the roundtable today. So I'm, I'm just reminding you of the uh, evidence matrix that we use for making our evidence uh, assessments for these agents. I put this up in part because of many of the public comments uh, uh, result, uh, revolved around some of the um, assignments for the drugs. So A, B, C, and D, these are our, our evaluations where we have high certainty based on the evidence. So our confidence intervals are relatively narrow. We think we understand the net health benefits, the, the benefits uh, uh, compiled with the harms. Um, the, those with pluses and minuses, there's more uncertainty. There's moderate or, or even low certainty. And so we cross categories of net health benefit, um, and, and sometimes we have not, not, not enough evidence at all, so we have low certainty, and that's the insufficient evidence uh, category. Um, so just reminding you about that. So omelizumab and mepolizumab, uh, we felt uh, uh, there was adequate evidence, particularly with uh, additional data um, from long-term uh, follow-up um, and clinical experience with these agents that um, we, we had uh, a small net real uh, benefits that were not substantial. So small net health benefits compared with standard of care. So that was omelizumab and mepolizumab. For the three newer agents, we didn't feel that the certainty was there. So our conceptual confidence interval was broad enough um, that we uh, rated this as a C plus. It could be a B, um, but because of uncertainty, um, we felt that there, that, that, um, uh, it, this rate uh, warranted a C plus um, uh, evaluation. So moderate certainty of comparable or better net health benefit. And then comparing any of the agents head to head, there was really insufficient evidence, even um, with the attempts with our network meta-analysis and others uh, in, in this area. Um, public comments still addressed there's the heterogeneity and the challenges of uh, uh, making comparisons across agents. Um, some of the drugs are, do have FDA approvals for other things, dupilumab, for instance, uh, atopic dermatitis. Um, many uh, may uh, improve allergic rhinitis, and there are some specific, uh, um, uh, less common uh, uh, um, uh, uh, diseases that these uh, drugs affect. Um, there were lots of issues with our network meta-analysis. It wasn't transparent enough. We now have hopefully have provided all the data and all of the code for doing our network meta-analysis. Um, each uh, company pointed to their favorite network meta-analysis in, in the literature, um, but all of them have been uh, summarized in Appendix B. Um, and, and thankfully, now, now uh, uh, the specific data that went into our network meta-analysis is mostly available. Um, uh, there were some concerns about uh, long-term, our uh, feeling of what long-term was. Uh, and, and some argued that a, a year's follow-up is long-term. For this um, disease entity, it's a lifelong disease. Patients may be on these agents for 10, 15, 20 years. We didn't feel like even two, three years of follow-up is long-term. We really felt like uh, we needed longer-term evidence before we felt confident. And then some, some of the comments felt we should focus more on the specific mechanisms of, out, uh, uh, of action rather than the outcomes. And that, that's really uh, against the philosophy of, of ICER. We really want to look at outcomes that matter to patients, not some theoretical benefits because we we have a unique mechanism of action. So with that, I'll take questions before we turn to the economic analysis. All right. So let's, we'll take, uh, we're going to take questions uh, from, the, from the CPAC. Uh, Tim, would you like to kick us off? Uh, thank you. Could, uh, can I be heard? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for your report. I've got um, a variety of... Uh, a variety of comments that I think maybe I'll just lead with the fact that I'm not convinced that the evidence that you provided uh, results in a B recommendation. I don't think the evidence supports that there is a small net benefit, and let me lay out 
some of the aspects and then I may actually have some follow-up. First, from the report it's clear that quality of life is the primary outcome that patients themselves say is key. None of the quality of life measures showed a clinically noticeable difference and the 95% confidence intervals around all but one of, two of them I believe, were not, did, did not reach, I think it's slide 20. Your slide 20. Yes. Uh, did not achieve clinically important difference. So there's no benefit. Patients and up to 95% on the confidence intervals do not see a clinical benefit in the outcome that's most important to them. Second, the reduction in um, exacerbations. A large amount of that is use of oral corticosteroids, which is, is important, but it's way different than a hospitalization or an emergency visit. And the absolute reduction is often less than 1%. Therefore, 99% of people are not going to see that benefit. And then I think there are two aspects of harms that I have some concerns about. <clears throat> One, I agree you know, with the data that you pulled from the randomized trials. But then you also included data from the FDA that notes some really serious and sometimes life-threatening adverse events, and I don't think that those were incorporated into it. And two, the other important harm to patients, as you outlined, or important decision-making, is the burden and the cost of care. I know we get into that later on in terms of our cost modeling, but I think that should be factored into the actual harms that are seen. So I may have some other things, but um, I think that briefly outlines it. Great. Thanks. Um, you want me to respond no, no, yeah, briefly? Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you have any comments? So, um, I, you know, I, I think the quality of life uh, issue is an important one, um, but, uh, I, you know, I think uh, it's also important to realize that these are averages, and some patients got no benefit, but some patients got clinically important benefits. So, um, this is, a, uh, so some patients had a, a remarkable improvement in, in quality of life, and I think you'll hear that from our, our uh, clinician experts and maybe our patient representatives as well, that some patients essentially have their asthma cured. Um, it's rare, um, but, but, but and, and then the other thing is that the, that the average is significant. So we're actually seeing at least a small benefit, and we, we feel, felt like, uh, from, from our estimation, um, that that small benefit in quality of life, reduction in asthma exacerbations, and so on, was worth the r very rare risks of anaphylaxis, but treatable in a doctor's office, um, and, and so on. So that was our estimation, but it, it's up to you as voting members to decide whether your estimation of, of the net health benefit is, is, is there. Um, I don't know if there were other things specifically. I mean, the modeling does take into account uh, the fact that uh, the reductions in ER visits and hospitalizations is, is a smaller proportion, so the absolute uh, differences are, 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 are much smaller, and, and, and that, that's important. But again, that's in part why the, uh, the quality of life measures both drive the model and are really important to focus on here. Um, and I, you know, I, I hear your, your concerns about the harms. I will say the one um, uh, question about cardiovascular outcomes um, that was raised by the FDA from uh, reports um, uh, from, uh, from, from the adverse re uh, event reporting system, when they looked very carefully at the randomized trials, they didn't see any real signal. So yes, it's, <laughs> I, I hear your, your, your uh, it's a small sample. Um, so, so If uh, I could just follow up then on one other thing about the outcome measures. Um, I looked in your analytic framework, and I don't know if there are data elsewhere, but a lot of the outcomes that were in your final health clinical outcomes are either not reported. Are, are, are not reported, that is, let's say, uh, days from work and other kind of measures like that, and the use of oral corticosteroids and FEV1s, those are intermediate measures, or at least they were in the analytic framework. I personally believe that use of oral corticosteroids could be considered a clinical outcome. I'm not sure I believe that reducing dose to five milligrams, et cetera, in 20% of patients is worth 100% of patients getting this, but um, at least the way the framework is put in is suggests that those outcomes should be downgraded in your assessment, and the others where there are blanks should be maybe upgraded in your assessment. Okay, thank you. Don. Dr. Tice, thank you um, for a good overview here. Um, just to comment, 
to follow on to Dr. Wiltz, um, and then a couple of questions. Um, we did hear yes last week from the clinical experts who said in their in their observations of patients that changes in quality of life didn't necessarily correlate very closely with, with what clinical improvements they observed um, from the standpoint of caring for patients under these treatments. So, you know, it, this is an issue that just for people in the room who haven't been to CPAC before, <coughs> we wrestle with always because we know that for the most part, I'm speaking a bit generally, but the quality of life instruments have limits in terms of, uh, in general now, in terms of um, getting at this point that I just made. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask a couple questions around the um, lack of a clear definition of response to therapy, which is always, again, problematic when we have multiple agents from different trials and different manufacturers. Um, but um, one thing that I wasn't sure about, and I looked for it in the report again last night when I read it, is what is whether there was some estimate in general or by agent around those that don't really respond to the treatment on one end of it. Um, and the other relates to this lack of clearly defined endpoints of benefit uh, relative to timelines. Um, and I'm just wondering, I don't know if this is the right immunologic word, but because I'm not an immunologist, but I'll use it, tolerance to therapy. Could you comment on sort of the front end of the group that doesn't necessarily respond and then if there is some sort of biologic effect of tolerance? Um, so the first question uh, about response rates, I, uh, um, I, I, there's no accepted definition in, in, in most of the trials. There was no reporting of, uh, res, you know, who responded and who didn't. I, I might uh, uh, let one of our clinical experts expand on that. Uh, tolerance is an issue. I, I haven't see, seen any data about people who responded initially and uh, uh, and then um, maybe developed uh, uh, antibodies to the, these agents and so no longer uh, uh, respond. But I don't think that's a, a been a major issue to date. But I, I, if I may, I might let our clinical, clinical experts comment on this. Oh. <laughs> I, was looking I didn't know to if it was okay. Dr. Ambrecht first. Yeah, no, if no, he's okay. no, no, please, please so join in. A little yeah. over on our time. So, so um, these are all okay. great points. I, I think the key point here is that quality of life as measured in these instruments is worthless. The NIH convened an independent panel, all the experts in the world that even made these instruments, and we recommended none of them were adequate. And so this instrument is flawed because there's a huge placebo response. So patients change dramatically, and there's no difference compared to placebo because the way these instruments are captured. So I. I find it very hard to say that your quality of life doesn't improve in a patient of mine that goes from um, no activities of daily limitation, staying in their house, now to become a fully functional person back to work. And yet the instruments are not measuring that. So I, I, I agree with totally with uh, Mr. Casey's comment in that regard. Um, I, I think the other point here is that um, in terms of the, um, the lack of response, uh, or are there measures lack of response? Um, we've presented some data at our American Thoracic Society. It'll be coming out in publication uh, in a few months um, that clinicians can use uh, asthma control test and lung function as a measure of response to these biologics. Uh, we've been using it clinically now for over two years with the newer biologics, and we stop them when patients don't respond to them. So we see no change in lung function. We see no change in asthma control measures using a validated instrument, the asthma control test. We stop these agents. Or we move on to a new one, um, which is great from the patient perspective because there has been, and not in the report, there have been now uh, at least uh, three reports or uh, publications of uh, controlled uh, data showing that when you don't respond to a one of the drugs, such as mepolizumab, you can switch that patient over 
and get a, a, a meaningful response uh, in those patients. Um, at this point, there, uh, for the other question about tolerance, um, there is about 5% of patients, depending on which of uh, the drugs you're looking at, that develop uh, antibodies to the drug. Those antibodies have no meaningful uh, value. They, they basically have no effect on efficacy, no effect on safety. Um, so at this point, we believe that development of antibodies um, doesn't uh, have any, um, translates to any uh, tolerance as we typically think in the pharmacology uh, literature. Um, and then I, I, maybe I'll address one last point, which was this life-threatening events occur. I take care of a lot of these patients. I, I just, uh, just discharged this morning a young lady that uh, had a life-threatening event, was intubated in her ICU, and um, they occur all the time in these patients. And um, when they're involved in these drug studies, they occur during the drug study. And when you try to sort out which are related to the drug versus their underlying disease, it is very difficult. Um, and so the FDA has to be cautious, I think appropriately so. Um, in terms of labeling what's on the label and what's happening in these clinical trials. But we as clinicians taking care of these patients are very comfortable with uh, these reported incidents of somewhere between 0.1 to 0.3 percent, translating to about one in a thousand patients may have an anaphylactic reaction of significance. We deal with this all the time and we are prepared to deal with it, and that's why they're administered in a healthcare provider's office. Um, and to me, again, um, that should not weigh heavily in terms of harm, uh, because it's a rare event, and it occurs often in these patients anyway, unfortunately, uh, or it occurs in these patients anyway, and it's un unclear if it's related to the underlying disease. So I, I see Dr. Kerfman has a question, but in the interest of time, we'd like to move on to the economic section, but we'll have time to come back to questions. So write it down, hold it, and we should have time to, to get to your questions later. So Thank you. Yeah. yeah, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Campbell, who will lead you through the economic evidence. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Tice. Um, pleasure to be with you all and to present uh, the evidence on cost effectiveness. And thanks to ICER for this opportunity to be with you. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, team members and colleagues. Um, in addition to using the evidence from the clinical review, so certainly that evidence flows into cost effectiveness as effectiveness is in that in in the uh, the phrase. We also worked with uh, colleagues at the University of Colorado, University of Washington, and ICER colleagues. And my, uh, the disclosures are listed there. So we're talking about cost effectiveness. And specifically, we're talking about cost effectiveness of each of the five biologic agents for treatment of moderate to severe uncontrolled asthma with evidence of type 2 inflammation. So we acknowledge that this is the broadest of of populations and encompasses the FDA label of, of all of the agents. We also acknowledge that some of the agents have a more um, narrow uh, label and, and population that corresponds to their, uh, their FDA label. And so um, we'll be speaking about throughout this presentation the things that really matter in terms of cost effectiveness. So I'll be highlighting some of the characteristics, including population characteristics that matter. Alongside that, there are also characteristics that don't matter as much, so I'll be highlighting those. Um, methods in brief, uh, I noticed that Dr. Tice had maybe two slides on methods for the clinical review. Um, you know, in modeling work, a, a lot goes into the, the methods conversation, and so, so we have more than two slides here, but um, uh, there is one slide I'll, I'll point you to in a, in a few minutes that, that sort of gives you the uh, Cliff's Notes version. So, so we'll get there, but um, but bear with us, and uh, we'll start with population characteristics. So we're we're modeling a cohort of individuals, and that cohort has characteristics um, consistent with that population I mentioned earlier. Um, one thing to note here is that, um, and and we're using so, sorry, we're using the characteristics from the trial evidence uh, to inform our, our our population characteristics here. So prior to treatment with biologic agents, 
we have a, a percentage of, of chronic oral corticosteroid use in that population, and that uh, percentage is not 100%, it's not 0%. It's, it ranged from 13 to 28% in the trials, and on average was around 17%. So just note that, um, as that's one of the key features of these uh, products and a characteristic that will come up later. Our interventions are the same as what was featured in the clinical review, so I won't belabor this point. Uh, of note, dupilumab has two different intensities, 200 milligram, 300 milligram dosing. Um, interestingly, the price is the same for both of those intensities, and so on top of that, the clinical evidence was, was very similar for some of the key signals, and so we're basically featuring a dupilumab estimate of cost effectiveness rather than a dose-specific estimate for 200 and 300 milligram. Our comparator for all of these agents, um, so it's a biologic plus standard of care versus standard of care alone. And that standard of care um, was that uh, featured in the trials. It's daily inhaled corticosteroids plus at least one additional controller therapy. Methods overview, I'm not to the cliff notes yet, so that's coming. Uh, methods overview is pretty standard for the ICER process. Those familiar with the ICER process, this would be pretty standard. We used a, uh, a Markov cohort model. Our perspective is a healthcare sector perspective, so we're interested in direct medical care and drug costs. Uh, we do run a scenario analysis that is a societal perspective, a modified societal perspective, so I'll come to that uh, in the results. Our time horizon is long run lifetime. Um, so although these agents are studied on average around a year in time, we basically take those findings and project the long run estimates of costs. Our primary outcome is the uh, quality adjusted life year gained and the costs versus those quality adjusted life years. Uh, our cycle length for the model was two weeks to approximate a duration of a exacerbation in a patient. So here's the cliff notes. So we're, we're trying to get at estimates of quality adjusted life year gains, as well as differences in healthcare sector costs. Those are the two main things, those are the main outputs we're wanting out of our model. How do we get there? Um, at a zoomed out level, we get quality gains uh, from these biologic therapies in three different ways. Through improvements in day-to-day -day quality of life, through asthma exacerbation reductions, and through potential reductions in the chronic oral steroid use. So those three things are sort of driving the quality gains, and they're in order of importance here. So um, in terms of our base case findings, you'll see that the order of importance is listed here. So uh, the quality of life improvements, we're giving the highest weight of, of the three. Health sector costs. We've got our, our manufacturer submitted net price. Um, I'll come to a slide on that particular, uh, those estimates. Uh, in addition to price of these biologic therapies, we have uh, cost offsets that occur mainly through th two main things, reduction in severe exacerbations that have a high cost, as well as reduction in chronic oral steroid use. And the long-term implications of that have been included in this model. So our cartoon of the model is featured here. We have two main living health states, the day-to-day -day non exacerbation health state as well as the asthma exacerbation health state. We also track mortality, asthma-related, and all other cause. Uh, so we run a, a cohort through that has the biologic plus standard of care, and then we run a cohort through that has standard of care alone, and we compare the difference in costs and qualities. Uh, just to note here, asthma exacerbations have three subcategories that we, that we track within the model, with um, the mild being that of just an oral steroid burst, the uh, moderate being requiring emergency department care, and the most severe being requiring an asthma hospitalization. Key assumptions, there are many in modeling. I featured four here. Um, one is that we assumed the same standard of care for all our comparisons here. We note that, there, that as, as Dr. Tice mentioned, heterogeneity was one of the themes that came up in this review. Certainly there's heterogeneity here too. Um, however, the heterogeneity that matters in the modeling, we attempted to uh, quantify and include in the modeling exercise. So we felt comfortable uh, that for policy-related decision-making here, 
that we could use the same standard of care in terms of the long run costs and outcomes for standard of care. Utility for the non-exacerbation health state was an important feature of this disease state. Um, in some health economic modeling, a disease state has the same utility no matter what the treatment. Here we're actually giving the flexibility and allowing for the fact that day-to-day -day asthma quality of life may be improved in patients with uh, these biologic therapies. And so we're allowing a utility increase due to that biologic therapy um, through an improvement in that day-to-day non-exacerbation health state. Exacerbations requiring uh, the more severe emergency department or hospitalization level of care. In those particular two subgroups, we actually allow for the possibility that those uh, situations actually increase mortality. And so if we had a reduction in those kinds of events, we may see a, a small reduction in mortality. So that's a built-in indirect um, benefit to these biologic therapies. Finally, chronic oral steroid use um, is associated with not only a disutility, but also long-term implications for cost. And so it actually impacts not only the qualities, but also the costs. And so if you could reduce chronic oral steroid use, you get a benefit on both sides. I'd like to feature the exacerbation-related inputs. This slide is quite busy, and I'm not going to belabor you with the details of it, but it's just to say that within the modeling, we wanted to know what the exacerbation rate was for all three subcategories of exacerbation, not just exacerbations overall. Uh, also important to the model was to feature the exacerbation-related inputs for standard of care alone. So at, at the end of trials that were studied in standard of care patients, the uh, annualized per person year exacerbation rate was 1.3 on average. And that's the value that we assigned to standard of care in our modeling. There is a plausible range there that varies and we'll look at that in um, some of our sensitivity and scenario analyses. Of note here, and as mentioned earlier in discussion already, the bulk of the exacerbations are in the oral <coughs> steroid bursts alone, and so um, only about 10% of exacerbations are of the more severe type for, that require emergency department or hospitalization. Utilities is a big topic here uh, for the cost effectiveness work in, in severe uncontrolled asthma. Um, we did not have direct elicitation available to us for this particular review, so we didn't have something like the EQ5D and evidence reported on that by agent for all agents. So what do you do when you don't have that? You do sort of the next best alternative, which is a mapping algorithm uh, where we have evidence on something that is reported and we try to estimate the, then the thing that we're, we're going after. Um, and so we could do that through arguably any of the instruments that Dr. Tice uh, reported on, the asthma control questionnaire, the asthma quality of life questionnaire, or the St. George's. Um, in this case, we, we decided to use St. George's respiratory questionnaire signal that mepolizumab reported as our base case. And that, in some sense, gives the benefit of the doubt to the biologic agents because, as, as mentioned already, that was the signal that was observed um, to be, in some sense, the strongest on average. So that non-exacerbation utility meant that for biologic treated patients, they received a 0.062 greater bump in their utility compared to standard of care alone in that non-exacerbation health state. So just, just to give some context to what that number means, uh, a 0.062, if we were willing to pay 150,000 per quality, an intervention that brought us a 0.062 improvement in utility, and that was the only thing it did, and there were no safety concerns, we would, we would be willing to pay around $9,000, a little over $9,000 for that benefit alone. So I just want to give some context to what that 0.062 means. In terms of uh, other things that impacted utilities, we had our exacerbation disutility, so events, patients in the exacerbation state didn't receive as much of a utility, um, so if we reduce those, of course, we get a benefit. And on chronic uh, oral steroid use, those um, that use chronic steroids also had a disutility. So if we were able to reduce that, we would actually get a benefit for the entire lifetime within this model. So that, that benefit is, um, uh, is there, and it's, it's built into this framework. 
so we'd like to thank the manufacturers. Uh, uh, I, I'm not speaking for ICER, but in this particular review, we were able to receive manufacturer net price from all five manufacturers. So we appreciate uh, that information. And that was the information we then used for the base case estimates of cost effectiveness. So you can see here that the percent off of wholesale acquisition costs is listed in this, uh, in this particular table and ranged from 74% to 91% of wholesale acquisition cost. So now to results. Base case, lifetime discounted costs and outcomes. Uh, the biologic therapies range from 16 to 16.32 quality adjusted life years, whereas standard of care alone got us 14 and a half uh, quality adjusted life years. So we're uh, achieving a significant, in my mind, improvement in terms of quality adjusted life years of one and a half qualities gained for biologic therapy compa compared to standard of care alone. And the costs are also listed here. On average, another 500 50,000 or so if we were to treat these patients with biologic treatment over their lifetime. What does that result in terms of incremental cost effectiveness? So the discounted incremental results are presented here by agent. And again, these comparisons are biologic plus standard of care versus standard of care alone. Um, they, they're a pretty narrow range in the 300 thousandths per quality adjusted life here. Wanted to feature one agent and no agent in particular, but in terms of one-way sensitivity analysis, we learned quite a lot about the drivers of the model. Um, and by drivers, I'm saying what, what moves the mark in terms of our incremental cost per quality. Uh, we saw in this particular exercise that uh, utilities for that non-exacerbation health state were quite uncertain about that estimate because it's based on a mapping algorithm and because it's only using uh, evidence from one particular agent. So that uncertainty is quite high, and that, that's at the top of our graph here. Um, that's followed by an annual exacerbation rate for comparator. Um, you'll see that, that that range of uncertainty is built into that heterogeneity I was speaking to earlier. So if, for example, our, uh, our standard of care population had two exacerbations a year rather than one on average, then we saw that the incremental cost effectiveness might move up to, say, 40,000 dollars um, down. So from 350, for example, to 310,000 um, in terms of the cost per quality. So, so really, none of these inputs in particular moved the mark very much um, and moved the mark close to a willingness to pay of, of 150,000 per quality adjusted life here. But what about when you take them all into consideration all at the same time? Um, that's what our probabilistic sensitivity analysis does. And here we found uh, near zero likelihood of achieving cost effectiveness at the uh, common, uh, commonly cited thresholds for these agents. So priced at their net price, uh, probabilistic sensitivity analysis suggests that there's low likelihood of achieving cost effectiveness. Now how about outside our base case? Um, maybe you don't think that's appropriate for whatever reason. There are many scenario analyses we ran. Of course, there are many more in our full report than we featured uh, here within the slides. We did a modified societal perspective where we did include productivity-related signals that we had in the literature. They're limited. But when including those, the incremental cost per quality was reduced by 5 to 10%. So I would say a, a relatively small reduction there. The network meta-analysis um, subgroup that Dr. Tice presented earlier, we ran that through the model alongside the uh, annualized exacerbation rates within that subgroup. And again, we, we didn't see much change in terms of the incremental cost per quality um, compared to base case. Now, responder scenario, it was interesting. So in a responder scenario, we attempted to, to use uh, assumptions that were not fully evidence-based, but we identified um, a, a cohort that we assigned to, um, to be responders, and, we, and within this scenario, we're treating only the responders in the long term. So say after uh, 16 weeks, we identified responders. We only kept responders on biologic therapy. And on top of that, we assigned all the observed benefit only to responders 
Um, so this is probably one of the major assumptions here and really needs to, um, needs to be more evidence-based for the future. Um, but given all those assumptions, our incremental cost per qualities did move from the 300,000s per quality down to approximately 200,000 per quality. On top of doing the responder scenario, we were also interested in doing sort of a, a collective best case scenario. And in this, um, this we feature in sort of three steps. The first step is to say, well, what if we had a population that was at the high end of all the observed trials in terms of exacerbation rate per person year? And what if a biologic agent actually achieved the best response of all those observed? Um, if we did all those things that, that are biasing the estimate toward in favor of the biologic, um, we would get an estimate of 226,000 per quality. So this isn't really a, a very pragmatic or, or feasible estimate for any one particular agent. It's more looking across the agents um, to see what we might be able to achieve in this space. Now if we did all that and we looked at treating only those patients who were considered to be chronic oral steroid users, then we see an improvement um, yet again into the 174,000 per quality. So because these agents are, are moving uh, the mark in terms of chronic oral steroid use, they have an opportunity to have a benefit there. What if we did all the favorable inputs and we added this, um, this ideal sort of setting of a responder that we don't have much evidence on, we would get an estimate of 156,000 per quality. So I'd like to feature some limitations of the analysis. Uh, as I've sort of alluded to, there's a lack of evidence across the, the five agents in terms of what we mean by responder um, and how discontinuation may play a role. And so, so we tr attempted to include those things as scenarios and be transparent about those things, but, um, but we placed less weight on the actual finding and there's uncertainty there. We assumed constant treatment benefits over a lifetime duration that may or may not be the case in, in this particular disease state. Uh, but we don't really see this disease state as one that's necessarily progressing over time. And so we felt like assuming tr uh, constant treatment benefits over the lifetime was a reasonable assumption. Indirect mortality did have an impact through uh, reductions in asthma-related hospitalizations and emergency department visits. and so. Um, there is that benefit that's baked into these findings, and um, I, I would argue that more evidence is needed there on mortality before you actually might put um, too much weight on that evidence, but it is here, and, uh, and that's why it's a limitation. Health utility for the day-to-day non-exacerbation state, it's our most influential input in the model, uh, and, uh, and so, so it's also one that we're quite uncertain about, and, and I'm interested to hear comments on, on thoughts around that topic. We received many helpful public comments and to, um, not to, uh, and so those are, those are written in detail in our full report and responses to comments, but um, some themes of those for the cost effectiveness work were concerns around using an average standard of care across assessed biologics given the heterogeneity. That is a real concern. I hope this presentation helped uh, you understand what actually does matter in terms of characteristics and what doesn't. We found that um, things like small changes in the annualized exacerbation rate actually mattered a small amount, but not to a great degree. Um, so we felt pretty confident in, um, again, using a standard of care that was appropriate across all agents. Uh, there was a suggestion to consider treatment responders within the base case finding. We certainly wrestled with that issue. We, we wanted to do that if there was evidence available across the agents, but we felt like we just couldn't do that with high confidence. Um, so again, a, an opportunity for future, uh, future research. Including the patient's voice and value metrics is certainly a message we received, and it's an important message. Interestingly here, I think we did include the patient voice in our value metric because we gave that benefit of the doubt on the uh, quality of life signal and how that mapped to a, a utility bump. So to the extent that that's important to you all, um, 
I believe our analysis does include the patient voice in this particular value metric, and, and it is very important to me too. I, I, that's a part of the work that's challenged, um, but in this particular case, again, we, we attempted to use the most favorable finding rather than a finding that may have biased against uh, the patient voice. So conclusions, biologic agents provide gains in quality adjusted survival. Biologic agents seem to be priced higher than the modeled benefits at commonly um, known thresholds. And finally, to achieve higher value, we might be able to do that through careful patient selection. Um, I mentioned the oral steroid, uh, the chronic oral steroid user subpopulation, and we might be able to do that through continued biologic therapy only for those who respond. So with that, I'll open for questions. Thank you. That's excellent. Stuart, would you like to kick us off? Sure, I, I have a simple question. Um, the, the studies, uh, the trials had between 10 and 20 percent oral contracept uh, oral uh, corticosteroid uh, users, and you used 70 percent for the modeling um, out the gate. The first sentence of one of the uh, two New England Journal articles about dipilumab said 45 percent were users of systemic glucocorticoids, although the adjective chronic was left out. I'd love to know from the panel, what do you think the real life percentage of patients in the severe asthma clinic come to you with on chronic oral steroids relevant to some of this cost analysis and the disutility associated with the drug? Oh, doctor, I think that question was directed at uh, our clinical experts to Okay. The, the question is really what percentage of your practice or a typical practice that would get these biologics would come in with chronic OCS, chronic oral cortical surgeries? Sure. That's a, that's a great question and um, one we've struggled with because also when you think about patients getting multiple bursts over a year, at some point they're almost on chronic right. daily steroids. Um, right. And so the um, American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society, define that as being greater than 50% of the year that you're being exposed on a daily basis to the steroids uh, is cons being consistent with um, uh, that definition. And so um, when we looked at it in a cohort study, it was around 30 to 40%. Um, that's likely higher than clinical practice because these are at academic centers where there's referral bias and so on. But I don't know if Dr. Samino Comment. What's more, I'm, I, I guess my comment more comes from just you know seeing the patients you know in the um, in the clinic and so again you know percentage probably going to be different um, you know looking at the population that right. we're talking about but I think for people who we consider biologics I would probably say that's like maybe 20 to 30 percent of mine um, will meet that definition that just um, Dr. Castro mentioned for the exposure, frequent, either frequent exposure for the burst or being on daily um, oral corticosteroids. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. Hi, Dr. Campbell, I have a, um, has a very specific question around um, assumptions about the long-term side effects of oral, uh, oral corticosteroids. Um, and actually this conversation about what, what percentage of patients are on steroids at the time that they're is, is actually relevant. So I noticed that there's no, there wasn't, uh, certainly the, the most important variable seemed to be baseline quality of life. Um, but uh, I wondered if, I didn't see a sensitivity analysis around the assumption around the long-term side effects of mm. oral contraceptive, uh, or, or, oral um, cortical steroids, sorry about right. that. Um, I dug up the number, in the report it's actually minus .023 on an annualized basis, um, and it comes from another health technology assessment report. Um, and that .023 is supposed to capture bone health, diabetes, peptic ulcer disease, infections. Um, it may be the case that the rate of those events is so low that right. even though they happen, that, that, that it is actually 0.023. But I was wondering if you had thought about a sensitivity analysis around this particular, um, this particular uh, assumption because um, uh, if you have a 50% reduction in use yeah. of oral cortical steroids, that seems like an important benefit. 
No, great point. Uh, thanks for the question. So, so recall that not only is there a disutility, a 0.023 decrement, and that's over the lifetime for folks that are chronic oral steroid users, but there's also a cost that we assigned to that, and, and it, it's the same disease states you mentioned. Um, so, of course, not all chronic oral steroid users achieve those additional disease states, right? So, the, so that, that work we did rely on um, from other health technology assessment groups um, in the United Kingdom in particular for, for estimate of a disutility. And so the expected value across those other disease states and achieving those is, is baked into that estimate. Um, fair point about the uncertainty around that estimate and, and how much influence that may well have. Um, I think the challenge there is that there are a number of inputs to the model that in combination are sort of a, a part of, of this discussion, right? So it's, so it's what's the relationship between chronic oral, oral steroid use and long-term cost and long-term disutility, and in terms of how do these biologic agents move the mark on that? Um, and, and I'd say probably, so unfortunately, the way in which the uncertainty analyses presented in this report come out, they don't really feature a, a full estimate of uncertainty in that whole concept. They're more one-offs. Um, now, within the probabilistic sensitivity analysis, we did you know, try to achieve that more comprehensive look. But I, I, I take your point that uh, we, pr we probably could quantify uncertainty in, in additional ways. Um, and, and build that further into the modeling work here. That's great. Greg, would you like to? And we're going to ask you to go, go in real tight on the microphone so that the folks uh, on the internet can hear. Okay. If you yell real loud across the internet. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thanks very much. Very, very interesting presentation. Um, I wonder uh, about uh, yet another sensitivity analysis. And that would be something like this. What if there were one or more biosimilars available? Uh, now, this applies uh, among these five drugs only at the moment for omalizumab. Uh, the core patent on omalizumab expired in 2017. And there are two biosimilars under development. One from Glenmark Pharmaceuticals is getting pretty close. And um, we might make the assumption that uh, if that did uh, win approval sometime in the next months or year, um, that the, the price would maybe be 30% lower uh, than current agents. And uh, would it be uh, interesting to do some calculations around uh, a potential biosimilar and include that in the evidence report to maybe kind of highlight why it's important to get these biosimilars to market. Yeah, so thanks for that comment. I, I would just say that um, there, are, there are within the full evidence uh, report estimates of value-based pricing for these agents that, that uh, may be able to be used in the context in the application of a biosimilar discussion. So, you know, whether it's whether it's a fair price for the agent or a biosimilar, you'd need to make assumptions moving from the agent itself and all the evidence on that agent to a biosimilar. But if you're willing to make those assumptions of close to equivalence, then <coughs> you could have you could you could sort of bound your estimates of a fair price based on um, the findings in the report. That's great. So I have a question about the estimates you used uh, for lifetime cost or life, lifetime cost for a chronic oral uh, corticosteroid users. So there seems to be some risk in the model if we've underestimated the lifetime cost or, I mean, not just on a, not just on a quality of life measurement scale, yeah. but, but in terms of all of the complications that can uh, occur yeah. from long-term exposure um, you know, to a OCS. Any thank, thoughts on that, if you don't Thank mind? you for the question. So um, I wanted to note, and I, I forgot to in the formal presentation, that we, we did work with ISER for mepolizumab, and that, that review has been out for a few years. Um, the actual, if you look at the findings from that report versus 
what we're, we have now, we actually um, see that the, the cost effectiveness estimate has come down a bit from our initial report to this one. Some of the differences in those two reports have been that we've actually included, there's more evidence out there on this very issue of uh, chronic oral steroid use and the long-term costs and, and disutility around that. So we were able to apply those estimates in this review and we were not able to in the prior review and it actually did move the finding down from say 380 some thousand per quality down to 340 thousand per quality. So they're important. I, I, would, I would like to emphasize that where we had a lot of uncertainty, we tried to bias these estimates in favor of the biologic agents. That comes out um, mostly in the quality of life mapping. But, but I think also it could be interpreted in some of the cost estimates that we used. We, yeah. um, we gave pretty large, in my opinion, cost estimates to 